verses number 1 and 2 should, should look very familiar to you um, as these are quoted in Romans chapter 4. And if you want to, you could, you could start turning to Romans 4. We're going to spend a little bit of time there as well. Uh, but let's reread verses 1 and 2 in Psalm 32. The Bible says, Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. And what a great blessing it is to have your sins forgiven, to have your sins covered. The things that you've done wrong when you've broken God's law, when you've transgressed God's law, and are deserving of a punishment and deserve to be punished, that, that you have been forgiven. Of those sins. That is a great blessing. Blessed is the man unto whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity. What does it mean to impute iniquity? It means that when you have iniquity, when you have broken God's law, you deserve a punishment. You deserve uh, to be to be punished, and that punishment is not imputed unto you. That is what forgiveness is. That is um, and that is a great blessing when you, you are worthy of and deserving of receiving punishment and God does not impute that iniquity unto you that that even though you're the one who's done it you're the one who deserves to pay for your crimes it's still not imputed unto you and it says and in whose spirit there is no guile so in Romans chapter 4 we see that this is quoted Psalm 32 verses 1 and 2 here are quoted in Romans chapter 4 in Romans chapter 4 is an excellent passage that I love turning to when we go out soul winning because this is such an important truth. And I'm going to kind of park it on here for a little while just because this is such an amazing truth and and so foundational and important, uh, just dealing with our salvation in general and also teaching us you know, that salvation has never changed. The, the method or the means by which a person is forgiven, the means by which a person is saved, the means by which your sins are covered has never changed. It's always been by grace, through faith, in Jesus Christ. Now, people didn't always know the name of Jesus Christ, but He is the Savior of the world. He is the Lamb of the world slain from the foundation of the world. He, he has always been the Savior. He's always been the Son of God. And that um, the, the timing of His death, burial, and resurrection doesn't change that He is the Savior. He was the Savior. People were looking for the Savior, and we're we'll getting into that a little bit as well tonight. But in Romans chapter 4, Look at verse number 1. The Bible says, What shall we say then that Abraham our father, as pertaining to the flesh, hath found? So what is it that Abraham found? Verse 2, For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory, but not before God. So what the Bible saying there in Romans 4, 2 is that if Abraham were justified by his deeds, by his works, by his obedience to God's laws, to, to, by being a good person, by doing good things, by being obedient unto the Lord, it says he would be able to glory. He would be able to say, hey, look at me. Look at how good I've done. I haven't done this and I haven't done that. And I've been following the steps of the Lord and I've been doing these good things. You can glory over that because you've been You have your own righteousness of following God's law. And that's what the Bible is saying here is that if he were justified, if Abraham were justified by his works, he would be able to glory over that. The Bible says, but you know what? He wouldn't be able to glory before God. For what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God and it was counted unto him for righteousness. So what was counted unto it? What is it? His belief, his faith. Abraham's faith. See, people like to think, or not people like to, people teach, some people teach this hyper-dispensationalist doctrine. Now, all dispensationalism, I think, is garbage. It's false doctrine. It's not true. Okay, there's there's no such thing as, as 7 or 9 or 20 or however many dispensations. Dispensations are, are a man-made doctrine that is just simply not true at all. Now, I don't want to get off into that whole subject, but what the, the where, where dispensationalism really becomes a big problem is when it gets to this hyper dispensationalism of people believing that salvation was different in the past and will be different in the future. 
that is another gospel. And the Bible says that there's an everlasting gospel. And it's the same gospel that, that gets you and I saved. And it's the same gospel that Abraham had preached unto him. It's the same gospel that Abraham believed that there's a Savior. And he put his faith in the Lord. And that is how he got saved. Abraham believed God and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Abraham's faith was what God looked to to make Abraham righteous. And it, the passage continues to go on to explain this concept. Verse number 4. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. So when you work, and I use this example all the time. It's a great passage for soul winning, as I mentioned. When you go to work, you receive a reward or a paycheck. right? When I go to work at my secular job, I work Monday through Friday. When I go to work, I get a paycheck every two weeks. Now, that reward or that paycheck that I receive, that's not grace. That's not... Um, my boss or who, you know, the, the person who writes the check at the company that I work for... They're not just feeling gracious after two weeks and decide just, well, I know you don't deserve this. Because that's what grace is, by the way. Grace is when you receive things that you don't deserve. When you're receiving a blessing or receiving something that is undeserved and unmerited. That's what grace is. When I go to work, I put forth my time and my energy and my work for the company, which in turn, they owe me money. That's a debt that they owe to me because the agreement is I'm going to work for you and you're going to pay me money in order to work for you. So the reward is not reckoned of grace. I don't get a reward by working that's not called grace. It's debt. It's owed to you. It says, but to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. So what this is teaching is that if I thought that I had to obey God's commandments to be righteous before God, to be, uh, to be accounted uh, as, as worthy or, or as to, um, to be justified in the sight of God, I would have to keep all of the law. I would have to keep it perfectly. I would have to be able to do that. And if I did, then I would be earning my way because I would be working the deeds of the law. I would be doing the good things kind of like Jesus did. Well, exactly like Jesus did because the Bible says that Jesus always did those things that were pleasing unto the Father. We know that Jesus was without sin, and um, which means he not only didn't do the things the Bible says not to do. He also did all of the things the Bible says that we need to do. So by the works of righteousness of Jesus Christ, He's the one who bought and paid for our salvation. It's not us. He's the only one who's ever earned salvation. And that's why He gets the glory. And He is the Savior. He's the one that saves you. We can't save ourselves. And if you're, if you're looking to the law as even part of your salvation, then I'm sorry, friend, you are not saved. Because the law cannot save you. You are looking to receive your own reward that is, that is not reckoned of grace but of debt, as if God would owe that to you, uh, your salvation, because of how good of a person you are. And ultimately, people who believe that you, that believing, putting your faith on Jesus Christ, believing on the Lord Jesus Christ, people who believe that that's not enough for salvation, at, at the heart of it are proud people. They're proud people. I talk to people all the time, and many people believe in this work salvation, and they'll say, well, you can't just, I mean, you can't just sin, or you can't just do this, or you can't just do that. The reason why I say they're proud people is because even the ones that will recognize, well, they're a sinner, they don't want to think that they're that bad. It's, it's, it's one of these things where they look at other people and say, well, they can't be saved. Their, you know, their sin is worse than my sin. See, my, I sin, but my sin's not that bad because I'm still trying to follow God's law and I'm doing all this other stuff. And they have excuses for why their sin isn't bad enough to send them to hell. But someone else's sin is bad enough. And it's a way of measuring themselves against somebody else as opposed to just saying, look, I am a sinner and I do not deserve salvation at all and I cannot earn it. And whether I obey God's law or not, 
I've already sinned and I already deserve a punishment and I need grace and I need a Savior. And when you put your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, He's faithful and true and will give you that free gift because that's what He promised. Yea, and God that cannot lie promised eternal life. He promised that unto us. He promised that gift of salvation. But let's get to now verse number 6 where, because it's important to get this context in Romans 4 verses 1 through 5. It brings up Abraham first and saying, look, if Abraham were justified by his works, then he'd be able to glory about it. But you know what? Not before God because God knows that he's a sinner. Abraham needed the forgiveness of his sins. He was not justified by the law. He was justified by faith. When he believed God, when he believed the promises that God gave unto him, God counted that faith as righteousness. That is how Abraham received forgiveness. That is how his soul was saved. That is how Abraham was born again. And yes, people have been born again all throughout history. Jesus rebuked Nicodemus in John chapter 3 when he taught him about being born again. He said, yeah, thou am a master in Israel and knowest not these things. He said, you don't even know about being born again. How could you call yourself a master of Israel and you don't even know the most basic thing, the most simple things? Why would he rebuke some, someone about not knowing something that they could have never known about? Of course people knew about salvation and being born again. Nicodemus didn't. He was unsaved. Yet he was, he was supposed, supposedly a teacher of the law and he needed, someone, he needed that someone teach him which be the, uh, the principal things. But let's get into this now in verse number 6. We saw Abraham was justified by faith. We see that being justified by faith has nothing to do with works. And in fact, the person who does no works but believes, is saved. So these people who say, well, if you believe, you will automatically have the works. Well, right here the Bible says it's possible for someone to work not but believe. They work not but believe. That's impossible. No, it's not. It's only impossible because you think it's impossible. You've made up some false doctrine that says it's impossible. It's not. That's why in James 2 the Bible says faith without works is dead. Yeah, that faith can die without works, but it's not impossible to have faith without works. It's just a dead faith. We need to have the works to keep our faith lively. But you know what? Having a dead faith doesn't mean you lose your salvation. It doesn't mean the, the eternal life ceases to be eternal. It doesn't mean the everlasting life that God's given you is no longer yours. Once God gives you something that lasts forever, it is eternal. It lasts forever. All right, let's get to what here the Bible records David is saying, which is where our passage is tonight in Psalm 32. Verse number 6, even as David also describeth the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works. Saying that God gives you righteousness. He makes you justified before God. He makes you righteous before God even though you don't have the works to do so. You don't have the works to say you are completely righteous. Jesus had those works, and those works get imputed unto you. Jesus' righteousness, when you put your faith in Him, are imputed unto you. Blessed is, excuse me, blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works, saying, Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. Now, what's interesting about this also, going back to the dispensational false doctrine, is that this reference is Abraham, which is prior to the Mosaic Law, but then it also mentions David in basically saying they believe the exact same thing and showing that both of them are still talking about salvation, it's talking about being justified before God, and both of them have to do with having your sins forgiven, your sins covered, God not imputing sin unto you, and that it's a matter of faith that does that. So David was under the law of Moses in you know, what would be considered the Old Testament. Abraham was prior to that. And here we are today, past the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And, and you know what I'm seeing in the New Testament? You know what I'm seeing uh, in God's Word in Romans chapter 4? is saying that it's always been by grace through faith. It's always been by believing. It's always been by faith as to how you can be justified before God and how your sins and iniquities can be covered and forgiven. Amen and amen. 
Now, turn if you would to John chapter 1. I want to point out something else here I think is kind of interesting. As I mentioned in John 3, Jesus rebuked Nicodemus for not knowing about being about just the concept of being born again. But in John chapter 1, I want to point out one other thing. In Psalm 32, 2, I'm going to re-read this for you. It says, Blessed is the man unto whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no guile. And guile would be like deception or fraud or faking it, right? That it's it's with a pure, you have a pure spirit, basically. You're not, you're not deceitful, right? And the reason why I bring this up is because I think this is interesting that verses 1 and 2 in Psalm 32 is talking about someone who's saved. It's talking about a saved person because they're blessed, because their transgressions are forgiven, their sins are covered, God is not imputing their sin unto them, and they're in their spirit there is no guile. That they're, they, they truly believe, they truly have faith, they're not faking it, they're not putting up a pretense, they're not, you know, it's, it's not some type of a fraud faith, it's a real genuine faith where they believe on the Lord with all of their heart. Okay? And the reason why I'm making a point about this, about there being no guile in their spirit is because Jesus actually said this about Nathaniel. So when Jesus was going around in his early days of his ministry and recruiting the disciples to go, to go follow him and become a part of his ministry, I believe that all the disciples other than Judas Iscariot were already saved when Jesus came to them and said, hey, follow me. When Jesus called them to become a disciple of his, I believe that they were already saved. And, and you know, I, I think sometimes people read the New Testament and, and they kind of have this, this incorrect thought that just because the New Testament is all about Jesus, which it is, I mean, the whole Bible is all about Jesus Christ, but you read the Gospels, you know, you see a lot of illustrations of salvation, which, you know, with people being healed and all this other stuff. And, and it's heavily, heavily teaching on salvation because it's so critical and so important. Absolutely. But, but that being said, that doesn't mean that people weren't saved prior to the birth of Jesus Christ or prior to even hearing any of his teaching of him, of him literally, physically, like, you know, teaching the word of God in person. That couldn't have been saved prior to that because just like Abraham was saved and just like David was saved, there have been other people all throughout history that have been saved where their sins have been forgiven because they believed God. And God counted their faith for righteousness. So, if Jesus is going to recruit disciples and people to follow him, and this is where the Lordship Salvation crowd gets it totally wrong, they want to equate discipleship with salvation, which the two are very, very different things. It's easy to be born again. It's easy to be saved. It's easy to receive a free gift. It's easy to become a child of God. Because the Bible says, yeah, and all that believe him, excuse me, the Bible says, and as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Those that believe become a child of God. You become born again. You are a son of God, a child of God through faith in his name. That is easy. But being a good child, being a good son, Following all the commandments, doing that which is right is not easy. That is work. Obeying the commandments is work. Those are the things that Abraham wasn't relying on to be justified. Those are the things that he would be, he would have aware of the glory if he was counting on that for his justification in the sight of God to earn him a place in heaven. But those are the things that we need to do if we're going to be a disciple of Jesus Christ, if we're going to follow in his footsteps, if we're going to do and try to do what he did. 
Now, we are not relying on those things. We are not putting our trust in those things. We are not putting our trust in those works and expecting a reward of eternal life because of our obedience to the law. But what we are doing is we're going to say, yes, I'm already saved. I'm already a child of God. And now I'm going to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. I'm going to follow him. I'm going to do the works. And I'm going to do my best to live up to what he has for me to do. And it makes sense that if Jesus is looking for disciples, that he's going to look for people who are saved. John chapter 1 gives us plenty of indication that this is the case already when he goes to people. Look at verse number 45 in John chapter 1. The Bible reads, Philip findeth Nathanael and saith unto him, We have found him of whom Moses in the law and the prophets did write, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. So if he says, we've found him whom Moses was speaking of in the law and the prophets. Obviously, look, there's plenty of places you could go to in the New Testament that shows. You could look at the, the, the woman at the well. You could look at plenty of other examples of people. They were looking for a savior. They were looking for the prophet. They were looking for the person who was prophesied in the Old Testament. That is evident. That is clear. And we can see that very clearly here. And they say, look, we found him. We found the person. His name is Jesus. He's of Nazareth. He's the son of Joseph. This is the Christ. This is the one that we've been looking for. This is the one who's been prophesied in the Old Testament. They've already known about them. They already believed in him. They just didn't know who it was going to be. And now they get to the point where they say, oh yes, it's Jesus. They heard the voice of the shepherd and they received him immediately. They received him gladly. It was not a big transition or conversion for them to put their faith in the shepherd because they heard his voice and knew that it was him. Because they're already saved, because they're already children of God. They're already looking for a Savior. Look at verse number 46. And Nathanael said unto him, Can there any good thing come out of Nazareth? So Nathanael's questioning, and his questioning, though, has more to do with, you know, scripturally, he didn't understand. He's saying, well, how could, how, how could this be because he's coming out of Nazareth? And, he said, and Philip saith unto him, Well, come and see. So Philip said, Well, come and see for yourself if anything good could come out of Nazareth. And this is interesting what Jesus says unto him. Verse 47, Jesus saw Nathanael coming to him and saith of him, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom is no guile. Now, I don't think he said this by accident. And I don't think this is just, well, it's just what he says. Of course there's meaning to it. And that word guile, you know, it's used in the Bible, but it's not used that often. And when we have the scripture in Psalm 32, verse 2, it says, Blessed is the man in whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no guile. I think this is very clearly showing us that Nathaniel was already saved. And that Jesus is saying that, hey, here's a saved person right here. Here's someone in whom is no guile. Why? Because their iniquity has already been forgiven. And because they're saved, there, there is no guile in their spirit. They have a righteous, born-again spirit as a child of God. Verse number 48. Nathanael saith unto him, Whence knowest thou me? So Jesus says, Hey, here's someone in whom is no guile. And Nathanael's like, Yeah, how do you know me? I think that's kind of funny, but that's how he answered him. Jesus answered and said unto him, Before that Philip called thee, when thou wast under the fig tree, I saw thee. Nathanael answered and said unto him, Rabbi, thou art the Son of God, thou art the King of Israel. So you can see, obviously, it wasn't some big thing for him to receive Christ as being the Christ. Perceive Jesus as being the Christ. It wasn't a big deal. He, he, he saw it. He knew it. They were already looking for it. And um, he already heard someone else testify of him being the Christ. And just the fact that he, he knew him and he was able to tell him, you know, what he was doing and stuff, um, that he received him readily and easily. Now, go, going back to Psalm 32. So, of course, verses 1 and 2 talks about the blessedness of the person who's saved, uh, who's not going to have their sins um, imputed unto them. Verse number 3 says, when I, kept my, when I kept silence, my bones waxed old through my roaring all the day long. 
For day and night thy hand was heavy upon me. My moisture is turned into the drought of summer, Selah. Now what I believe this is describing here in verses 3 and 4 is the feeling of keeping your sins to yourself and, and kind of you know owning them and holding on to them and, trust, and trying to trust maybe in your own works and your own obedience and how good you are to try to save yourself as opposed to to putting your faith on the Lord and receiving that forgiveness from the Savior as opposed to trying to achieve it yourself through works. And that's why he's talking about keeping silence. And we're going to see, what was he keeping silence from? He's keeping silence from acknowledging his sin unto the Lord, from, from giving up, just, just admitting, yes, I've done wrong, God, I deserve a punishment and, and, you know, just confessing that sin to the Lord. And I think that this is something that everyone experiences and it's just a matter of how do you deal with it. You, everybody knows they're a sinner deep down inside. I don't care. Sometimes people will say things and I, I've come across crazy beliefs and some people say, oh, I haven't sinned in, you know, however long and, and they deceive themselves. But we all know deep down inside, and before you get saved, when you just keep your silence, I think this is pretty descriptive. My bones wax old through my roaring all the day long. There's something not right inside. There's something that doesn't feel right. Verse 4, for day and night thy hand was heavy upon me. My moisture is turned into the drought of summer. So this is, a, um, you know, you're, you're in a place where, where God's hand is upon you and you don't feel quite right, your moisture being turned to the drought of summer. And um, this is that internal description of just knowing that you're, you're, you're not right, knowing that you know, your, your sins are not forgiven. Because if you're trusting, here's the thing, everyone who's trusting your horse, and, and I'm not saying that everybody has taking the time out to really ponder and think about these things. I'm just saying, you know, based more off of, or partially at least off of my own personal experience before I was saved versus after I was saved, as well as just some biblical truth from Scripture here, and, and of course this, this passage being one of them, where it's talking about the salvation and the blessedness you receive of, of having that weight lifted, of having that debt that you owe paid, and the relief that, that you receive from that, from that burden and that heaviness being taken off of you. And I know from my own experience of salvation, when I put my faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and called on Him to save my soul, that that burden was, was lifted. And I knew that, that I had received forgiveness of my sins, something that I was seeking out, even though I wasn't consciously, actively trying to figure out how can I pay for my sins. It wasn't a thought in my mind. But once the, the sins were removed, once the forgiveness was received, then I had realized, and I thought, wow, I was like someone who was, was you know, thirsting in summer and was experiencing the drought of summer and my moisture was all sucked up out of me. And then I revealed, felt the refreshing of the salvation uh, once you realize, wow, all of my sins are forgiven. Wow, how great. And it's such, such uh, uh, rejoicing. This is that description that is, that is going on here. Let's jump down to verse number 5. Because verses 3 and 4, he's referring to when he kept his silence. But then that's contrasted here with verse number 5, where he's not keeping his silence anymore. And says, I acknowledged my sin unto thee, and mine iniquity have I not hid. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord, and thou forgavest the iniquity of my sin. This is a huge truth that we, you know, people need to get this down. And God, you know, ultimately, God doesn't ask or demand very much of us at all. There, there's not very much that, um, hey kids, split up right now. Move over there. There's not very much. And you know, I'm stopping the sermon one more time. Okay, you're going to be very sorry after service. 
You better sit still now from the, here on out and pay attention. No talking. <clears throat> God doesn't ask very much of us. He doesn't demand very much of us. I don't know why for some people it's so hard to just acknowledge when they've done wrong. But that's one of the things that God wants us to do. He wants us to say to acknowledge our sin unto him. And of course, this is extremely important. This is, this is a requirement of salvation. If you look on the back of our cards, we've got the, the things, you know, the Bible way to heaven on the back of the invites that we give out to people when we're, when we're going out soul winning. And one of those things is admit that you're a sinner. See, you could learn everything about the Savior. You could learn all kinds of stuff about the Bible. You can learn all kinds of great truths. But it's not until you're willing to admit that you've done wrong and there's a punishment that you deserve to face. It's not until you can admit that and understand that and accept that before you can receive a Savior and receive forgiveness and receive the payment for your sins. Because if you think you're self-righteous, if you think that you really haven't done anything that bad, if you think that you don't deserve any penalty, then you're proud and lifted up and you know nothing. And no matter how much you think you know about the Bible, it's going to do you no good because everybody needs to get to the point to where they can admit, say, look, I've done wrong. I've done wrong. And why is that so important? And that's so important on many, on many levels when it comes to forgiveness, when it comes to receiving mercy. You know, we've been talking a lot about, I've been preaching a lot about just salvation in general and how salvation, our eternal life, is completely based by faith. But you know what? Even beyond that, once you become a child of God, once you have faith in, in the Lord, once you already have eternal life, you know, there still is a chastisement and discipline that you can face in this lifetime from God when you are when you when you stray and when you when you are disobedient to the Lord he will punish you and he will discipline you now this is so important to get this through through our own everybody through our own heads of acknowledging when you've done wrong and any parent understands this perfectly that when you, you discipline your children because you're trying to teach them right from wrong. And oftentimes you'll have a child who they know they've done, they, you know, they've done whatever it is that's wrong, but they don't want to admit that they've really done anything wrong. And they may end up getting disciplined for it, but then they're going to have a bad attitude about the punishment and discipline because in their minds they think they didn't do anything wrong. And that child is going to need to get punished and chastised and disciplined over and over and over again until it gets through their head where they can admit and say, yeah, you know what, I've done wrong. And it always takes a while and it's worse for the child because they're going to need more and more chastising and punishment than, you know, than otherwise they would if they can just acknowledge it, own it, identify it, and say, okay, look, I've done this wrong and just admit it. That act of admitting does so much to help bring you back into a good standing and a good relationship. And it's going to help you to go down the path of forsaking the sin. You know, admitting it, admit it, and then, and then be able to, like once you've admitted it, you know, why would you want to keep being wrong? We should, we should go and try to um, do what's right. So acknowledging our sin... And it says, Mine iniquity have I not hid. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord, and thou forgavest the iniquity of my sin. So he's like saying, Look, I've admitted it. I've been open about it. I've told you about it. I've confessed my transgressions, and you've forgiven the iniquity of my sin. Now, uh, real quickly here, I just want to make this point before I continue on. I have it in my notes here. And what's great about this is that we see very clearly here that the psalmist here, David, is talking about confessing his sins to the Lord. Confessing his transgressions straight to, straight to the Lord. We do not believe the, the, the false doctrine that the Catholic Church teaches 
that you need to confess your sins to some middleman, like some Catholic priest, and go to some box and, and confess sins to some person, and they're going to you know, be some intermediary <coughs> between you and the Lord and try to give you uh, some, some type of penance of, of saying, say, chant this prayer a you know, hundred thousand times or whatever, and then, uh, and then everything will be okay. I'm sorry, man cannot forgive sin, and that priest can't forgive your sin, and there's no reason to be confessing your sins unto a man anyways when you go straight to God, who's the one that you have the problem with in the first place. He's the one who's going to be chastising you. He's the one that's going to be disciplining you. So why are you going to go to someone else? Why don't you go straight to God? You know, the only mediator that there is between God and man is the man Christ Jesus. There is no mediatrix. It's not Mary it's not any, any other person. It's not Peter. It's not any so-called Pope from the Catholic Church. It is Jesus Christ himself. And you know what? We, can, we have the right and the authority to be able to pray directly to the Father. But this concept of acknowledging or confessing your sins to God is found in many places. Um, I'm going to read through some of these just for sake of time. Psalm 51, verse 2, the Bible says, Wash me throughly from mine iniquity and cleanse me from my sin, for I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. So he's asking to be cleansed. He's asking to be forgiven. And then says, because I acknowledge my sin. I acknowledge my trans- transgressions. I'm opening about it. I'm, I'm, I'm just telling you straight up, Lord, that here is my sin. Proverbs 28.13 says, He that covereth his sin shall not prosper. People try to cover them and hide them and pretend like they didn't really sin and ignore it. It says, uh, But whoso confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. When you can confess your sins to the Lord and forsake them, just just say, okay, God, I've done this, but I'm going to try to not do that anymore. I'm going to walk the right path. I know I was wrong. I'm not going to do this anymore. Um, and not, of course, not just say it, but actually, you know, forsaking it. God's going to have mercy on that. And again, parents can understand this. When you have a child who is stiff-necked and stubborn, that does something wrong, and they don't want to admit they've done wrong, they're going to get the full brunt of whatever punishment or discipline is appropriate. But the child who understands that they've done wrong and can admit and say, you know, I'm sorry. I know I shouldn't have done that. I don't know why I did that. It was kind of stupid. And I'm, I'm going to try not to do that again in the future. And, and um, you know, they may still end up getting a, a punishment, but the, there's, it's way more likely for that child, that person, to receive mercy. We need to be able to admit when we're wrong and stop being so stubborn. Stubbornness is is actually a really wicked sin. Uh, 1 John 1, verse number 8, the Bible says, If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If you think that you don't sin, the Bible says that the truth is not in you. So this is the the sinless perfection crowd that, um, oh, what is that guy, that Jesse Lee Peterson, that, that phony, that fraud, that, that false prophet, believes that nonsense. He thinks that you could be sinlessly perfect. Well, in, John, in 1 John chapter 1, the Bible says that the truth is not in him because he says that he has no sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make Him a liar and His word is not in us. Do you see the contrast between someone whose spirit has no guile? Right? Someone who deceives themselves... If we say that we have not sinned, if we say that we have no sin, as opposed to the person who has no guile because they're confessing their sins. Jeremiah 3, verse 11, the Bible reads, And the Lord said unto me, The backsliding Israel hath justified herself more than treacherous Judah. Go and proclaim these words toward the north and say, Return thou backsliding Israel, saith the Lord, and I will not cause mine anger to fall upon you. So God is pleading with this, with this nation 
And he's saying, look, return. I know you're backsliding. Backsliding means you're, you're falling away. You're sliding back from the Lord. You're, you're getting more and more involved in sin. You're getting farther and farther away from the Lord. And God's just saying, look, I just want you to come back to me. Look, just come back to me. Just, just turn around, come back, and I will be merciful unto you. He says, for I am merciful, saith the Lord, and I will not keep anger forever. Okay, I will show you mercy. I just want you to admit you've done wrong. I want you to come back to me and we can repair this. I am merciful. Verse 13 says, only acknowledge thine iniquity. He said, all I'm asking is that you just, just, just fess up and say, I've sinned. I've done wrong. Acknowledge that you've done wrong and God is more than willing to be merciful. And God is willing to spare His anger when you can show your, your humility in admitting guilt, admitting wrong. The, look, no, whatever you've done, if you could just, when you admit that you're guilt, you, it's going to allow you the opportunity to move past that, to get beyond that sin, that transgression, and move forward. But the, but the more you want to lie about it and deny it and try to, to, to come up with excuses... It's just going to perpetuate and just make it last that much longer as well as make your punishment worse and worse and worse. I don't know about you, but I'd much rather be on the, the merciful side and the forgiving side of God and, and be owning every sin that I've ever done and, and telling God about it and, and not just telling about it, but forsaking those sins as well. But that's what God wants here. Only acknowledge thine iniquity that thou hast transgressed against the Lord thy God and hast scattered thy ways to the strangers under every green tree and you have not obeyed my voice, saith the Lord. And turn if you would to Hosea chapter 5. This is one place I just want to... This, this is my last point on this topic. Hosea chapter 5. Because don't think that you can be like that stubborn child that thinks that they can outlast their parents in their stubbornness. The one who thinks that they can be unrepentant and still end up getting relief because they're going to wear mom and dad down and, and to the point to where they're just not going to discipline them because it's, because it's too much work for them to do it. And you know parents don't be that parent that gets broken by the child and you just give up. It's extremely important, especially from an early age, parents, and this is just a bit of advice, that you need to demonstrate your resolve and your commitment to the raising of your children to where if they continue to do wrong, that you will follow up every single time with that correction that is needed and not just get, oh man, I have to correct me, oh, I don't want to do this, and, and blow it off. Because if you get this established early, if you show them you, there, there is a boss in the house, there is a ruler of the house, and that these are the rules and you're going to follow them, it's going to make your life much easier from the beginning. And look, every child has to go through this. I have gone through this with every single one of my children where they have to get to a breaking point. Where they have to understand that no matter how much they may want to resist or rebel, that dad will never back off and back down. And that they're going to ultimately realize that they better get in line and get in place because... There is going to be punishment and discipline because dad's not going to back down on, on the rules in the house. Now that doesn't mean that I'm not merciful. Of course, there is plenty of times where I give way less punishment and discipline and extend a lot of mercy to my children. But there's always going to be a point, you know, you know when it's never, they're never going to receive mercy when they're continuing to be disobedient. When they're continuing to say they didn't do anything wrong, when they're continuing to argue, when they're continuing to give excuses, that is not the time they're going to receive mercy. And that is all the more important time to be able to continue with whatever punishment is necessary for whatever's going on at the time. Now, 
we see an example in Hosea chapter 5. There's some verses in verses 14 and 15 that, you know what, don't think that, that God is going to break before you, you know, that, that you'll be able to break God in his resolve. He'll break you well before you can break him. Hosea 5 verse 14, the Bible reads, For I will be unto Ephraim as a lion and as a young lion to the house of Judah. I even I will tear and go away. I will take away and none shall rescue him. I will go and return to my place. Look at this. Till they acknowledge their offense and seek my face. In their affliction, they will seek me early. So he's basically saying, I'm going to be like a lion unto Ephraim. I'm going to be like a young lion to the house of Judah. Meaning, I'm going to be ready to tear it up. I'm going to be after them. I'm going to be on them. I'm going to be, you know, destruct, destroying and tearing. And, and he says, I will take away and none shall rescue him. I'm going to cause bad things to happen. And then he says, you know what? And I'm going to go and return to my place. And I'm going to leave them to their mess. And I'm going to leave them in a bad circumstance. I'm not going to be there to save them and help them out. And I am going to stay until they acknowledge their offense and seek my face. He says, until that happens, they're going to keep on having bad things. They're going to keep on having problems. They're going to keep on having um, this tearing. And no one's going to rescue them. And God makes sure that that happens until they acknowledge their offense, until they recognize that they're sin, until they seek what's right. We need to get this down in our lives in order to receive the mercy that we all ought to want from the Lord. Uh, going back to Psalm 32, verse number 6. For this shall be... For this Shall everyone that is godly pray unto thee in a time when thou mayest be found? Surely in the floods of great waters they shall not come nigh unto him. So this verse is, is also interesting because it says here that they'll pray unto thee in a time when thou mayest be found, in a time when God may be found. That verse implies that there's a time when God may not be found. And another just urgency and warning to people, especially people who are unsaved, that there is a time when God may not be found and when God may not hear you anymore. It wasn't in my notes to go there. I'm not going to turn there, but you could read in Proverbs chapter 1, and it talks about people who God stretched out his hand, God was there, God called out unto them, God was trying to help people, but they refused. They didn't want to have anything to do with it. They rejected God. They rejected God. They rejected God, and God says, you know what? Fine. You're going to call unto me, and I'm not going to hear him. You're going to try to reach out for me, and I am not going to be there for you. And this is a truth in Scripture that is found in many places. This is just one verse. Uh, turn if you go to Isaiah chapter 55. This is just one verse here in Psalm 32, 6, where he's saying there's a time when a man's be found, when God may be found. Okay, make sure you're, you're calling on God in a time when he's going to be found, because you don't want to get to the point where God can't be found anymore. Isaiah 55, verse 6, we have this, uh, uh, basically the same thing being said here. Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts and let him return unto the Lord and he will have mercy upon him and to our God for he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. Again, seeking the Lord while he may be found. When he's there. Because you don't want to push things and push things so far and be unrepentant to the point to where God says, you know what, I've had enough of you. And then you're not going to receive that mercy that, that you know, when you push a loving, a long-suffering God past the point of being long-suffering... You've really done a number on yourself and we need to be humble and keep ourselves lowly and looking to the Lord so that we don't get to that point with God. What a terrible, what, what a hopeless thought that must be to call out to God and to, and to finally get to a point to where you're saying, okay, well now I'm going to call on God and it's too late. And, you know, 
I wish the world could understand. I wish people could understand this and not think that they can live their life and do whatever they want to do and just ignore God, ignore the Bible, ignore Jesus, and not do anything and just think that on their deathbed, then they'll just accept Jesus and get saved. And then they'll have eternal life. Now, obviously, if they accept Jesus on their deathbed, they would get saved. But here's the thing. Don't, you, know, you may end up messing up that opportunity for yourself if you think that you're just going to pull out some, some fire safety card at the, at the last minute and this is like somehow your plan, God's not going to recognize that. That's not going to be a genuine conversion anyways if you're just, if you're just trying to cover your bases before you, it, before you die. Most be, the reason why people even have that thought is usually because they, they already don't even understand salvation. They think they have to live a certain way, so they don't want to live that way for their life. They want to have fun and then, you know, turn to the Lord when they don't have any more days left. And, and then it's like, well, if I have to be good for, you know, one hour, then whatever. And um, they don't even understand the free gift. They don't even understand salvation. But beyond that, what, going back to the point here of what I'm, what I'm teaching is that, you know, for some people, they may push things too far. To where God says, you know what? When your fear cometh, then I'm going to mock. Then I'm going to laugh. When your fear cometh as a whirlwind in Proverbs chapter 1. The Bible says that God's going to mock. And yes, that is an attribute of God. And that is one you don't want to mess with. Seek the Lord while he may be found. That was in 2 Corinthians 6, 2. For he saith, I have heard thee in a time accepted, and in the day of salvation have I succored thee. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. You know what? Now is the time to get right with God. Now is the time to acknowledge your sin. Now is the time to, to admit your, your sins and that you've done wrong and your iniquities and your transgressions. Now is the time to get right with God. Now is the time to say, God, I'm sorry. I'm not going to do this again. I need to get right with you. Now is that time. Psalm 32, verse 7, Thou art my hiding place. Thou shalt preserve me from trouble. Thou shalt compass me about with songs of deliverance. Now this is an interesting, you know, from, from this point in the Psalm, Psalm 32, we have a, trans a transition from, you know, addressing God and, and speaking these facts in the beginning part of the Psalm to now, the, the object is no longer God, right? And so in verse 7, it's thou art my hiding place. Obviously, he's talking about God being, um, being his defense and his preservation. Thou shalt preserve me from trouble. Thou shalt compass me about with songs of deliverance. That's joyful. Selah, right? But now, starting in verse number 8, the, the narrator goes from addressing God to now addressing, I call it y'all, right? We're in the south here, so I'm going to call it y'all. It's calling, you know, ye in the scripture. It starts off in verse 8 with thee, but then in verse 9 transitions to more people. And now it says, I will instruct thee and teach thee in the way which thou shalt go. I will guide thee with mine eye. Saying, you know, first addressing God and, and demonstrating the blessedness of the, of the man whose, whose uh, sins are forgiven, whose iniquities covered, and, it, and kind of going through, I admitted my sins unto you, Lord. You're my defense. You're my shield. And then in verse 8, now I'm going to instruct thee and teach thee in the way which thou shalt go. Verse 9, be ye not as the horse or as a mule which have no understanding, whose mouth must be held in with bit and bridle lest they come near unto thee. So now it's time for the person who has received salvation, the person whose sins are covered, to go and teach others how they can also receive that forgiveness and to teach, you know, and, and to teach people, hey, don't be like that whole like an animal. Don't be like an animal that needs to have a bit in their mouth and just needs to be led this way and that way. Why don't you just accept the salvation? 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse number 12. 
explains that you know this is basically how the world is those who are unregenerate those who are not children of God those who who have not accepted salvation the Bible says now we have received not the spirit of the world but the spirit which is of God that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God which things also we speak not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth but which the Holy Ghost teacheth comparing spiritual things with spiritual but the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. But he that is spiritual judgeth all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. For who hath known the mind of the Lord, that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. So we see here you know, that the natural man, he doesn't know the things of God. He can't understand the things of God. He can't understand the Word of God because they're spiritually discerned. You need the Spirit of God to help you understand what this spiritual book is saying. And the Bible saying here that who hath known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him. He's saying, well, how can you instruct someone unless you have the mind of the Lord? He said, but we have the mind of Christ. As a born-again child of God, having that Spirit of God in you, we have the mind of Christ. We have the Holy Scripture. We are, uh, have the spiritual understanding, being a child of God. The Scripture has been opened up unto us that we can instruct. So just like Psalm 32, 8 says, I will instruct thee and teach thee in the way which thou shalt go. We can do that. Every born-again, saved child of God ought to be able to do this because you have the mind of Christ, because you have a Spirit in whom is no guile, and because you have the Word of God, you can instruct and teach people and teach them not to be like animals. Don't be like the animals that just need to be controlled by putting a muzzle over their face to control their appetite. No, why don't you use the Word of God? Why don't you understand the Word of God? Why don't you first receive forgiveness for your sins? Why don't you confess and forsake your sins? Why don't you understand and admit that you've done wrong and that you need a Savior and that you can put your trust in the Savior? Then you can have this book and God's Word and God's instruction opened up unto you as well so that you can... Um, not just be like some animal. Verse number 10, Psalm 32 says, Many sorrows shall be to the wicked. Many sorrows are ahead for wicked people, for people who have not received forgiveness. It says, But he that trusteth in the Lord, mercy shall compass him about. And again, I love that it uses that word trust, because trust is, is synonymous with believe. When, what do we have to do to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. It's the same concept, the same word as trusting in Him. He who trusteth in the Lord, mercy shall compass him about. Where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. That's the mercy that compasses you about by trusting in the Lord. Verse number 11, be glad in the Lord and rejoice ye righteous, and shout for joy, all ye that are upright in heart. Wow, what a great blessing it is. What, how exciting it is to be saved, to have your iniquities forgiven and your sins covered, and to know that you're a sinner and God's not going to impute that unto you. What a great uh, reason to be glad and to rejoice and to shout for joy that that's never going to happen to you. Uh, let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you for the encouragement. We thank you for making salvation so easy. We thank you that it's a free gift and that you've done everything for us, dear Lord, and that it is a true blessing to just know that all of our sins, all of our iniquities, everything has been bought and paid for, and that Jesus Christ took our sins when he died on the cross and his soul descended into hell, and then on the, third, on the third day he rose again from the dead, dear God, and that he got the victory over death and hell, and he made the ultimate sacrifice and paid for our sins in full, and that that debt that we owe has been paid by him. Him. Thank you, dear Lord, for, for loving us so much to do that for us. And, and how easy it is and you, that you've made it for us to have all of those sins washed away because of what Jesus did for us. God, Jesus deserves all the glory. He deserves all of the credit. It's not our righteousness. It's not works of righteousness which we have done, but it's by His mercy that you saved us, dear Lord, that we thank you for showing mercy and having long-suffering on us, 
and loving us and giving us this free gift. God, help us to instruct others. We have the mind of Christ. We have your word. We have the Holy Spirit residing within us, dear Lord. And, and we all who are saved have a spirit uh, in, whom is, in, in which is no guile. Just by virtue of, of having that new man, that inner man within us that is born again. Lord, help us. To be a good, to have a good testimony, to be a good shining light in this dark world. Help us to reach others with the truth, Lord. And uh, we love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.